Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. We're rejoicing and we're glad in it. So good to see all of you tonight. Reverend Rice, so good to see you. You as well. well. Yeah, come on in the room. Look, invite someone, invite a friend, a family member to be with us tonight. We're in our Wednesday night book slash book study, Bible discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so good to see all of you tonight. Shout out to everybody on YouTube. We see you. Shouts to everybody on Facebook Live. Those of you on the church stream and to everyone in our church Zoom. Uh, Reverend Rice, do you have any announcements for us tonight? Yes, too. I uh, want to make sure that everyone is aware that our uh, 2024 scholarship applications are available now. Deadline for submission is Sunday, June the 9th. And we have two information sessions and they're mandatory for those who are interested in applying. They will be held on Sunday, May 5th and Sunday, May 12th uh, after each service. So hop on in, go to the website, get more information. And then we are excited that on Sunday, May 19th, we're going to be celebrating. So it's your anniversary. Oh, I didn't mean to give a concert, but we're going to be celebrating Pastor Coach's 20th pastoral anniversary. We are so excited, Pastor Code. So come on out. That day is going to be a day full of fun and excitement. You'll get more information about what we have going on, but make sure you plan to come out on the 19th for one of our worship services, 845 and 11. We're going to celebrate this amazing gift that God has given to our local body and God, we're great. We know that, um, Pastor Coase, we want you to know that we're really grateful for you and looking forward to the celebration. Praise God. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing everyone uh, this Sunday in one of our two worship services. <laughs> Certainly as a church family, our hearts are heavy. Mm. We lost one of our long long-standing deacons yesterday deacon leonard davis yeah went home to be with the lord yesterday yeah and uh in the chats you all can just send up prayers to his family and i was just eyeballing deacon davis on sunday mm -hmm. at the 11 o'clock service um I think I even uh, mentioned him in passing at some point in the service or in my sermon. I mentioned Deacon Davis and, um, you know, Deacon Davis is, is, was the chair of the search committee mm -hmm. that I initially met with mm. on December the 2nd. No, 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 no on december the 6th if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. uh 2003 it mm. was a saturday i've got to check my calendar make sure i'm giving the right date mm. when i came down in the snow on the train <laughs> from new york mm. I took the train into Union Station. Then I took the Metro out to Branch Avenue <laughs> and was picked up by Deacon Griffin. Sure did. He's the first person I met from the church. Mm. Deacon Griffin brought me to the church. I met with the committee in what is now the minister's suite, minister's room. Mm -hmm. And Deacon Davis was the second person that mm. I met from the church, shook his hand. Wow. And he's the one who called me on Friday, uh -oh. February, February the 6th <laughs> at 9.15 p.m. sharp. Uh, you were at the church by 11 o'clock. So, <laughs> damn it. He called me. I was in New York. He called me. Okay. He said, Reverend Coates, the church just voted. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm -mm. 
I'm reminiscing y'all. So y'all, we just lost one of our. It's a moment. Special guy. He was such a special guy. He was my dad's best, best friend. Mm -hmm. Best friend. Wow. And, you know, he made the best cakes. He was an amazing uh, cook, baker. Anybody that's had his cakes knows that he know. But and just a, a, a quiet, you know, guy. Still waters, but you know, still waters run deep. Very, yeah, very and, quiet. Uh huh. Yeah, he's he's gonna be missed. I called him not too long ago to check on him. Um, you know, he was he was playing a game. He said he was just playing a game and just chilling out a little bit. Talk, not a man of many words. So we had a little conversation, but it yeah. was good to talk to him. I'm broken. I'm my broken hearted today to hear yeah. that. He he made those cakes when I first came to the church. I think some of the weight I gained was because oh, of the cakes, cakes. Davis Ooh. made for me. Ooh. Mm. I remember going over to the house, mm. to the house, and seeing Deacon Davis and Deaconess Davis. Deaconess Davis. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think before I went, I called and I said, Deacon Davis. What are you doing? He said, I'm going to court. Yep. Court. He going to, I said, oh boy. So he called watching all of his daytime court shows. <laughs> yeah. that's so watching funny. all of court shows going to court. So oh, that's hilarious. Oh, Miss Deacon Davis. I remember him, I remember him calling me that night. Mm. I promise I'm gonna move on. He called me that night. February 6th, Friday night, 9.15, he said, Pass. He said, Reverend Coates, the church just voted. We had 710 people here at the church. Oh, yeah. And he said, 685 voted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to select you as our pastor. And uh, the end of the call, he said, and Reverend, we're going to follow you as you follow Christ. Mm -hmm. I never forget that. That's mm -hmm. the that's he said that to me. Mm. And that really stood out to me. I was a 31 year old. I'm on now. Young minister in graduate school. And mm. here is this mm. man, leader in the church. many years my senior who said we're going to follow you as you follow Christ that said a lot to me it said a lot to me about the heart the spirit of Mount Eden right. and really gave me the uh, let me know that that's where God wanted me to be many of you who know the story know that I was called to another church Yeah. <laughs> the very next day <laughs> the very next morning in another city in Detroit hmm but by 1130, that Friday night, I was down here. So we are praying for his family. God bless you, Deacon Davis. Well, <laughs> let's press on tonight. Let's pray. Do dear Lord, we love and adore you tonight. We thank and praise you for this time to gather together as a church family, friends and members of the church. And we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to pause, to come before you, to receive direction and impartation. Lord God, speak to our hearts. We pray for comfort and peace and direction, Lord. We are going to hold on to you wherever we are. We gather tonight in the midst of so many challenges and trials, loss and grief, all types of grief. And Lord, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, your word, you say in your word, Jesus says in the word that it's expedient that he leaves, that the comforter might come. Lord, send forth your comforter, your Holy Spirit to comfort our hearts. We need comfort today. Lord, we look to you. We turn our hearts over to you. We turn our lives over to you. Lord, and we just pray that you would meet each and every one of us at the point of our need. Lord, we pray for light and hope and love and joy and peace, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this book discussion. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight we're going to continue to finish chapter four. We're going to try to finish chapter four of really this amazing book entitled All Together You. If you don't have it, if you're with us for the first time, it's entitled All Together You, Experiencing Personal and Spiritual Transformation with Internal Family Systems Therapy. Ooh. And it has truly been transformational. Yeah. And one of the things that helps me to really think about this whole concept of internal family systems is when I think about family in the in the in our everyday lives we have an extended family i'm going to see members of my extended family this saturday as many of us we all are traveling to charlotte for my uh, aunts one of my aunts 70th birthday celebration it's going to be all kind of family members there and you all know how our families are it's all Types of family members there, young, middle-aged, old, some who are quiet, some who are not so quiet, some who are very spiritual, some who are not so not so much. <laughs> um, some who are very religious and rigid. Yeah. And others who are very authentic and really tell you like it is. They just might not do it with, you know, a certain kind of softness. It's like so many fam different types of people in your family. In our churches, we have all kinds of people in our church family. Mm. People who are at various stages of life, people are at various stages of development, mm. and yet they're in the family. Well, well, the internal family systems therapy is based upon the work of Dr. Richard Swartz, who says that the same way that we have multiple people in our in our family systems. Mm. We have sub-personalities within us that are family members. And there are many different types of sub-personalities within us. And that we really want to, if we want to, if we want to be healthy and whole, we want to really figure out how to get to know those various family members. Particularly the exiles, and that's who we're talking about tonight. Particularly those parts of our personality that were wounded, that were burdened by some negative life experience, right? Um, and because of those negative life experiences, they've lost access to their natural positive qualities. When something is injured, when, when a when a part of your body is injured, it loses access to its to its natural way of um, of being. Um, if you have a torn Achilles and I have a torn Achilles, there's something about my gait or my walk that's different because I had that break, I had that set, I had that injury. It has been surgically repaired, but but there is something different about my gait, my walk, right? Because of that, I might favor one particular leg as a result. And so we don't just have a hindered part in exile. We really can have multiple different hindered parts in our internal family system that are the product of many different types of experiences. Last week, we learned that we can have sort of overt and covert exiles. We can have, you know, sort of exile parts of our personality that we're very clear of, that we're very much aware of, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can have other parts of our personality that might be more covert and we may not be as readily aware of. And chapter four really invites us, it really challenges us to really take the time to listen well I think those are two very important words, listening well, because there are times when we might listen or, but we don't listen well. Sometimes, you know, you can listen, but you're listening to get your response together. Right. You can listen in order to prepare 
your counter. Mm -hmm. But I think this listening well is very important because the exiled and wounded parts of us need us to listen to them and their experiences without formulating a counter, a response, you know, a challenge, mm -hmm. a rebuke, right? They need, so we want to listen well. I think if we're going to make it through the path of healing so that we can show up in our God image, our core self, and letting the God image, our core self, be in the driver's seat of our car and not our hindered parts, we're going to have to learn how to listen well to those parts of us that are really hurting. Mm -hmm. They're really pained. And so if you missed last week's um, Bible study discussion, I want you to get that. And, you know, I want to share with you a scripture reference because I think a lot of times we treat our hindered parts, our exiles, the way that Elijah treated his in 1 Kings chapter 19. When you read 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah was afraid of Jezebel, someone who had put out and sent out an edict to take his life and had deputized emissaries to go find Elijah. Mm. And the Bible says that what Elijah did was Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, he went and hid mm. up under a tree, a juniper tree. Ooh. That's how he dealt with his fear. And a lot of times when we have hindered parts that are afraid, that are that feel shame, that might be angry, that might be deeply wounded and scarred, we hide. And that's what we talked about last week. What are the ways that we hide? We hide behind overworking. We hide behind busyness. We can hide behind church work. We can hide behind exercise. We can hide behind some kind of addiction. Mm -hmm. We can hide, you know, there are a range of ways that we can hide. And the goal of hiding is designed to mask the pain. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about last, last week. You know, I suspect that many of us have in our bathrooms, I'm trying to have this light behind me. We have in our bathrooms uh, pain relievers. These are pills that we pop when we're feeling a headache or some kind of pain. Well, many of us in our own lives have become experts of pain relief experts of masking the underlying root cause of our pain. No, go, let's go back, please. Let's go back to the first slide. Let's go back to the first slide. I'm still on the, in the beginning. And so chapter four is really about, Lord, I got this light behind me. Uh, Do you have a, um, is it a screen? We can wait to you. Is there a what now? You have a, Okay. What about this? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, many of us have been experts of masking our pain, right? Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we never get to the root cause of what's happening. And when that's happening, we never reach a point where we're able to unblend from our woundedness so that our God image can come forth. And I really love chapter four because it really walks us through the various ways in which we really need to, especially the last part of the chapter really invites us to, to really spend time of listening to our wounded parts. So listening to the, the hurting parts of us, okay? So I wanna ask this question. This was a question that we didn't get to last week. And I want to at least go through two of those questions. The first is, what thoughts come up when you consider the statement? You can go to the next slide. When you consider the statement, if you can't feel pain, 
You don't really know when something is wrong, right? If you can't feel pain, you don't know when something is wrong. So those of you who remember last week, we last week we talked about the gift of pain and how pain is really a message that our bodies are sending us that there's something wrong. But if we get used to masking the pain through, I don't know, pills, potions, some activities, uh, some addiction, then we won't ever take the time to find out where that pain is coming from and then addressing it, right? So what I want to ask, and, and the right author asks us, the, us this in the Q&A portion, what thoughts come up when you consider the statement, and I want you to share some thoughts you may have on this, Reverend Rice. And I want those of you listening on whatever platform you're on to type in your answer to the question. this question. What thoughts come up for you when you consider the statement, if you can't feel pain, you don't know when something is wrong? What Any, what, any kind of thoughts come up for you, Reverend Rice, when you think about that? The pain of feeling the pain. Mm. So we numb it or either ignore it or really numb it. Like a lot, think about a lot of people, especially addictions, you know, drinking. I think about people who are addicted to alcohol or use that as soothing. And the biggest issue, I think, with pain, as we said here, as she said, your, your, your pain is a gift, right? It is a gift. And you know that your grown self, your mature self understands that, but there's a portion of you that doesn't want to face it. You know, I always say you can't heal what you want to reveal, but the, it's the revealing of it that is so difficult. So I want to lose myself. I don't want to, I don't want to come in touch with it because it hurts so bad. So bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have someone who has raised their hand. Are we going to uh, raise hands tonight. Can we do that tonight? Uh, sure. All right. Let's go to one person. Okay, I see Patricia. Patricia has raised her hand. Patricia, you have any thoughts when you think about this question? Uh, if you can't feel pain, you don't know when something is wrong. Patricia, can we open up her line? That was an accident. I apologize. Oh, oh you okay. just wanted to say hallelujah? Okay. All right. No problem. Oh, no problem. Right. Okay. Can you lower and, it, Patricia? And so, and so I see folks right now in the on the church's stream, mm -hmm. and I see folks in our Zoom who are answering uh, this question. Uh, someone just said, "Being left unhealed, it causes more damage." Right. Right. And so, and so, then I want us to talk about well, what would it look like, Reverend Rice? What would it look like for you to listen well to your pain? And those of you who are in whatever chat, whatever platform you are on, type in the type in the chat room. What it what would it look like for you to listen well to your pain? Yeah, I'm finding personally that listening. This is why this study is so amazing. You know, uh, um, you know, noticing naming, you know, and nurturing even in those painful places has really blessed me because ultimately I know what I know. And that is that it will lead to my healing. So me, you know, working with acknowledging it and really, it has really led me to seek to, to deal with it. And, and it is big. It could be what is what did what he said? What's your name? And he said, We are Legion because we're many. <laughs> I got a legion of it's, but it's okay because it's such a blessing, it's freeing. So, to yeah. answer your question with one word, freedom, what does it look like? Freedom, wow. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, when I think about that word freedom, and I see all of you who are typing in on your various platforms, I see those of you on the church's stream sending in your responses to what it would look like to listen well to your pain. I think for me, it would be being in a no judgment zone. Yeah. Like not judging myself, not judging others. Thank you, Sherry. Like accepting uh, acceptance mm -hmm. and being okay with that. Mm -hmm. And not allowing other people's opinions, oh, 
P O other people's perspectives, O P P other people's perspectives, um, and uh, to not be applied to me, right? To be free from other people's judgments. That that kind of you know would help me to listen well to that. my pain. Yeah, to not apply other people's sociological, religious, intellectual views, opinions, and experiences um, on to whatever pain that I might be addressing. Anita says, listening well to my pain helps me to acknowledge, and it just left me. I didn't see it in the chat. So thank you for all of those who responded to that. Issues. She said that acknowledges that there are issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for that. And so the next question I want to go to is out of the list of ways that the author describes that exiles develop. And if you're on page 45, 46 and 47, she gets she goes into ways in which the exiles are formed mm -hmm. right in the middle of that page. She says some exiles come from various places. Out of the list of ways that exiles develop, out of the list, out of the list of ways that our wounded parts develop. And, and let's kind of go through them. She talks about on page 45. Mm -hmm. um, if in our lives we witness violence that is hitting, throwing, slamming doors, threatening, gunshots. If we witness violence in our home or in our community, if we are targets of violence or bullying, by a parent, a sibling, or a friend, if we are called names or screamed at or told things were our fault when they weren't, or if we were touched in sexual ways or shown sexual images when we were young, or our developing bodies were the subject of inappropriate sexual jokes and observations, then we are likely to develop exiles that are frozen at that age, at the age of that experience, and often feel powerlessness, terror, and shame and isolation. She goes down, she says, if our parents were too engrossed in their own worlds to take care of our emotional or physical needs, if we needed us, if they needed us to make them okay or emotionally caretake them, if we were too emotionally connected or enmeshed, enmeshed with one parent because the other wasn't there or the marital relationship was conflicted, or if we were left alone to figure out life on our own, then we couldn't develop exiles that feel alone, broken, over-dependent, over-responsible, or angry. And she goes through other ways. She talks about children that might be the product of abuse and abandonment and neglect. Those are some of the direct ways that exiles are formed. But then she talks about more indirect ways that exile parts of us Um can can be formed. She says we can have stealth exiles and she gives different examples. If one comes up in a perfectionist home where there was such high unrealistic expectations that that could create an exile in a person. Right. And she talks about other ways. If if we had a sibling or a family member who was chronically ill, we may develop exiles that believe that our needs and our feelings don't matter because everyone else is taking care of that other family member. If we were bullied in school, there are a whole host of ways that are there. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about the ways that your exiles developed. Which of the ways connect with you? Which ones connect with you? And Reverend Rice, I don't want to ask you because I don't want you to be the, the, the only subject. You know, these are very <laughs> sensitive issues I appreciate for that. people Thank to you. talk about and to discuss. Mm -hmm. I think they can be sensitive for a whole host of reasons. There can be the experience that we had was painful. Right. I think there might be times where people might struggle with the notion of feeling as if they're blaming someone else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in their family for an experience or perceived experience that we had. Mm -hmm. The sense of like, well, I don't want to 
feel as if I'm blaming my aunt or blaming my I uncle. Them for yeah, yeah, or blaming my mother or blaming yeah. my father for something, right? And so these can be very uh, difficult issues. But I want those of you in the chat, if you're so inclined to to type in the platform that you're on, out of the ways that exiles develop, which ones connect for you? Mm -hmm. Is it from abuse? Is it from kids bullying you at school? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, things of that nature. Here. I don't uh -huh. mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was okay. talking about this the other day because I had a chance to sit a little bit and reflect. And I think the reason why it becomes so important that we discover where the exiles come from, because oftentimes the intent is not to demonize or to, you know, but but there's still an impartation that impacts, you know, where you go with it. And for me, I was sharing with my niece the other day, and I actually had to get therapy for this because my I had an issue with my weight as a younger, well, <laughs> in my life, I've had some challenges with with my weight. And I remember that my father was very critical of that. Now I use the word critical, um, but in my life and particularly as a young girl, having what I ate critiqued and comments about, you know, basic, you know, what I thought was basic consumption and all this, I took this all the way up to my adulthood because he would react like, what, are you really going to get another piece of chicken? Or I'm using that, I'm, you know, this is just kind of general um, conversation. But at the end of the day, it left me at a place where I felt very vulnerable all the time about critique. It just made me tender. Now, he critiqued in a myriad of other ways. The critique, and Doc, we've had these conversations, were intended to help you be better and do see so-and-so, even as a young girl, Darcel reads the paper all the time, you know, and it was like, oh, God, you know, now I got to I got to be Darcel in order to be OK, you know, and so on and so forth. And I'll never forget when I went to counseling and whoever knows me in here and you know that me and my dad were like this. This was my bestie, my guy. And so after he passed, I still kind of struggled with this whole idea of acceptance, you know, being enough, you know, and those kinds of things. And I remember my counselor, I particularly spoke to his critique of my eating habits and how they were in his mind, a direct correlation to my weight and so on and so forth. And my therapist at that time, and this is 20 years ago, um, said to me, tell me about your health history in your family. And, you know, I said, well, my dad was diabetic and, you know, his aunts and his mother were diabetic and several of his aunts were amputees. And he he then kind of broke this down to say your father's obsession, right, did not necessarily come from a place that intended to be hurtful. He intended to be helpful based on his exiles, if you may, or his experience, because he was worried, I don't want my child to go through what they went through, right? If you keep on this trajectory, if you keep on this track, you could lose a little toe, you could lose, you know, he was, and think about that being 40 years ago, 50 years ago, at a time when, you know, we, we weren't visiting doctors and you weren't getting medication and you weren't getting, and all of that. You get this, I don't want to belabor the point, but does um, that make sense? No, it does. And and thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And we all have our own story that kind of connects with that. And I think one of the things that come up comes up for me as I listen to you and as I look at the comments on the various platforms, I'm trying to keep my eye on, on Facebook okay, and YouTube okay. and the church. As I listen to the various remarks that people are making, one of the things that I want to help people to understand is the trauma that we deal with individually also takes place within a system. Mm -hmm. There's systemic trauma. Mm -hmm. There's racial trauma that Black people have to have had to deal with that gets mapped onto our family systems. Right. Right. So you have to think about a, a societal infrastructure, a white supremacist structure that says 
Black people are not human. Mm. Mm. Black people are beasts. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Black people don't know how to, they aren't clean. Right. They are dirty. Mm. They are evil. They're demonic. You know, they're all, there were all kind of societal understandings about Black people. Right. And the response to that, particularly in the 1800s, okay. as 19, at 1800s, as, we're, as Black folks are coming out of slavery, mm -hmm. getting more freedom and opportunity, was to disprove right. ah. these Ooh, societal good. assumptions in the eyes of the dominant culture. That's good. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have a whole stream of, of respectability politics among Black people. Wow. It, it happens in a variety of ways. It happens in, the, it happens in you know, it ha you know, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, one of uh, the professor, my professors, I didn't take a class with her. I kind of audited and sat in the class, but she taught at Harvard Divinity School when I was there. Um. Judge, of, a wife of the late Judge A. Leon Higginbotham, but she wrote a she wrote a book called Righteous Discontent, and in that book she talks about the politics of respectability among Black women in the early 1900s. Wow. Right. So these are Black women who develop ideas like um, you have to really have a clean house, mm -hmm. cleanliness, wow. clean up your yard. Have a clean yard. You know, some of you have those had those grandmothers and great grandmothers where you walk in the living room and what's going to be on the couch? Plastic. That plastic is going to be on the couch. <laughs> and that living room was going to be immaculate. Mm -hmm. You don't go in that living room and mess it up. Right. You don't sit in that living room. <laughs> you don't sit in it. You got to look clean. You have to be clean. Sometimes some of the first comment or remark that those women would say when they saw their children and grandchildren would be a remark about their looks. Mm. Mm. You look not you look so pretty. Mm. Your hair looks nice. Mm -hmm. And so some of this policing of mm size and how you look mm, 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 is the mm. response to the racial trauma that black people have had to endure. I love that. Yeah. Like yeah. that was real. Yeah. Okay. And so if you're coming up in a family system as a young person and you come up in a family system where mm. then you might just want to be you don't want to be neat one day. You don't want to tuck your shirt in. Right. You just want to. You're in a family <laughs> system where you get judged and demonized. Right. Regarded as an, you know, a pariah to the family, mm. a betrayer of the race, mm. because you don't fit this paradigm. Right. 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 No, that's good. Any deviation within the, the the nuclear family is deemed, you know, you are you are um, you're betraying the race, right? And so, you know, in our family systems, it our family systems exist. The co black culture exists within this broader history of racial trauma that black people have had to deal with. Mm -mm. So. Wearing jeans as a woman in the 1900s right. was a commentary on her femininity mm. and her fitness as a wife, mm -hmm. as a mother. Mm -hmm. mm. Eating a slice of cake, too much cake. Right. Oh, you bet. The, all those little, all those little comments and judges, mm. comment, judgmental. Com oh, you gonna go back into the? I think. It's not just about health, right. and that is a part of it. Right. There's also this kind of broader racial, the whole thing that Black people have had to endure, like, 
We have to be twice as smart, like, work twice on. as hard Jesus. in order to make it. No, that's like, real like that's been that's true, right? But that yeah. is an unfair standard mm. to right. put on a three year old child, right? Right, yeah, mm. like, like you can't take a break, yeah. you can't, you sitting you there. Know, your best can't be a C in school. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. No, you. We have to be twice as hard, and there are, and there's a whole legacy of industrial industrialness and like working hard and like you gotta work and work and work, work like work, work, <laughs> work. You're right, though. Some of our workaholism is a function mm. of racial trauma. Mm. Mm -hmm. When the reality is, people and should be able to enjoy life. Right. And breathe. And breathe. And sit. And sit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. take a vacation. Mm -hmm. And do nothing. And yes, have a mental health day. Mm. Mm. With work that, and work, that's work. Been lazy. Yeah, the work and work and work mentality comes as a product of slavery. It it's is. a slave mindset. Where in order for us to make it through, and yeah, I'm not critiquing work, but I'm contextualizing it. Right, right. And so we have to contextualize so many thoughts, and as we attempt to listen to our wounds mm -hmm. and listen to, you know, where our families got certain principles and ideas and certain values and all of that. It, it We have to situate it within concentric circles of mm -hmm. traumatic exper life experience. So when the text talks about an exile is formed from a painful experience, that's not just a painful experience in your family right. with your mother and father. We've got to include within that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll come next week. Um, there's a, a therapist. He's an expert on racial trauma. Resma uh, mm -hmm. Menachem, I think that's his name. He really specializes in racial trauma and how Black people are really products of these historical legacies of racial trauma. That we're not immune from. Right. Yeah. Right. So so we want to move. So the goal is to move towards our exiles. We want to move towards our exiles so that we can listen well to them. Pastor Coates. Yes. I did want to say that um, in, in line with the um, racial um, uh, trauma, one uh, Miss T said that color conscious was always told that I was dark from both sides of my family until I went to college and heard <laughs> James Brown sing, I'm black and I'm proud and realize how beautiful I am inside and outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and so another. That's a whole set of. Yeah. In, in, in my sermon at one of the services, I talked about this legacy of skin tone stratification in the black community. Ooh. Jesus, whole you know, other conversation. And, and that's a part of that sort of systemic legacy mm -hmm. of trauma and the pain that that causes people, mm -hmm. you know. And the pain that they were trying to prevent because, and, and knowing where it comes from helps us to, as you said, contextualizing it is so important because they were worried. You're going to be in the field or you're going to be in the house. You're going to get some clothes or you're yeah. going to have some rags. You know yeah. what I mean? You're going to eat. You're going to suffer. It's going to be a tough life, you know. Yeah. If you're yeah. the master child, if you lighter, you know, you may, yeah. you know, and so thinking about a mother who's wanting the best for her child, however distorted that may be, that's coming even from their trauma, right? That's interesting. I mean, these these things, you know, it comes from a variety of ways. Thank you, Miss T. I mean, I'm thinking about this whole thing. I mean, I know you all aren't into like popular culture the way I am, but like right now, there's this whole beef between Rick Ross and Drake. Yeah. And the way and the way that Rick Ross is taking a jab at Drake is by calling him white boy. 
Oh he goes, wow. He does his lives. He goes on and does his lives and he and he and he says, Come on, white boy. He calls him white boy. Oh wow. The implication is he's not black enough. Right, right, right. right. Wow. It happens, it happens all around. I remember years ago, somebody from Barbados saying people from Jamaica weren't like mm. really black yeah. enough, you know, yeah. because people from Jamaica, you know, were in some way, you know, mixed. Right. Oh no, get it right. But all all of these sort of politics of of race are situated with this within this whole context of racial trauma. And I didn't really mean to get into any of that at all. But 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 when you are looking at listening well to your exiles, it's not just about listening to your your nuclear family. We've got to situate it within this broader societal context as well, and so. What we want to talk about tonight is how to move towards our pain, move towards our exiles by taking a different look at how we deal with our pain. See, we tend to cope with these little hurting parts of ourselves. And see, here's the thing about the exile, and I think this is really important. It's really interesting in light of the example that you gave, Reverend Rice, because this is the case for all of us. Mm -hmm. These exiles were formed when we were children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the most part. Right. For right. the most part, these exiles, all of the experiences that she gives, the author gives on pages 45, 46, and 47, talk about the formative, the formation of these exiles when we were children. Mm -hmm. Think about a child. A child is at his or her most, most vulnerable state. An infant, a toddler, a child is at a point where they need and depend and rely on someone else for nurture, support, protection, affirmation, a sense of security. Mm -hmm. And so these exiles we have lived with, whether they have been, whether they are direct or indirect, whether they are open or whether they are stealth, right. whether they are overt and we're aware of, or whether they are hidden, we have lived with these wounded, hurting parts of us for a very long time. Mm. And listen to some of your, what people were texting and, and I'm sorry, putting in the chat. People talked about, you know, having to be the adult for my family, taking care of everyone because a parent or both of my parents were not available. For a child not to have been able to experience being a child because a parent was unavailable, not around, strung out on drugs, out in the streets, whatever. Right, right. We have been dealing with those wounded parts for a long time and even when we think we have overcome it oftentimes we have not even when we think we have worked through it and gotten over it all oh, pastor come on it was 30 years ago i'm not thinking about you know my dad who used to come home busting and everybody hitting my mama that's over that's i've gotten over that you would be surprised yeah. no, you're how right. we've been traveling with the luggage mm. of those experiences. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we're not traveling with it with new luggage. We're traveling with it with that old luggage from the 70s. Right. See, don't, don't luggage from the 70s didn't have wheels on it. <laughs> Y'all remember this luggage? Oh, Go to the airport or you get on the Greyhound. You had to carry oh, this bag and pull it and drag it. <laughs> Today's luggage, y'all, they almost gonna have remote controls on the luggage. Right, right. You know, just press a button, it'll walk itself through the airport. Nah, <laughs> it ain't that easy. <laughs> that luggage, that baggage we're carrying is um it's that old luggage from the 70s. Right. We tend to cope with these hurting exiles by shaming them. Mm. Mm. 
And this is really why where I want to help somebody tonight. I want us to renew how we deal with those painful parts of our lives mm -hmm. by trying to develop new tools that we put in our toolkit for dealing with those hurting parts. We shame them by saying things like, you can't believe I'm a grown man or woman feeling this way. We shun them. We do our best to shut them up and mm -hmm. to lock them in the basement of our souls. Mm -hmm. in a, and I suspect that those of you listening to me right now know that there are a variety of ways that you shame and shun and shut up and shut out those <laughs> wounded parts of you. Wow. You say things like, you know, I'm a grown man, you know, uh, I'm not going to cry over somebody who touched me when I was six. Right. Right. Or somebody who teased me. Mm. Right. Some male insecurity as adults is linked to childhood pain. Mm -hmm. It's linked to childhood pain. Some of our insecurity as adults is linked to childhood pain. When a child grows up afraid and being uncertain if the adults in his or her life are going to come home, right. that child can grow up to be an adult in a relationship and be have a very anxious attachment mm -hmm. and be very fearful that the people that he or she is in relationship might leave him or her. Mm. Right. Thank you, Laverne. And so we don't want to push. And when we shame and shun them and shut them up and lock them in, what we end up doing is we end up pushing them further and further away. And I don't want us to do that. What Jesus says to us is he says, come unto me. Ooh, oh, all of you who are weak and heavy laden, Ooh. all of you who are burdened, Ooh. all of you who are injured and wounded, Jesus says, bring it to me. I'm going to give you rest. But unlike Jesus, we try to manage the pain or make the pain go away. We lock it up. Mm -hmm. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to. Listen to it. Hmm. Put it in the basement. Put it in the back room. I don't want to hear it. Hmm. I don't want to hear the cumulative impact of other kids in school talking about my teeth. Right. Right. When I was a kid, I had an overbite. Hmm. Oh, my God. And there was a girl that I liked. I remember one day walking in the in the classroom and she was talking about my overbite and my big lips. <laughs> you don't want to have neither now. <laughs> you laughing. Baby, look at you now. You laughing, Reverend Rice. <laughs> you laughing. But that's See, I don't, I'm not. No, no, I, I, I'm not, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the overbite and I don't see the big lips. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And when <laughs> I heard her do that. Right. Right. That did something I'm not proud of. Uh oh, uh oh, that's okay. And the child part of me, I was in the seventh grade. Okay. And that child part of me did something in the classroom that I'm not proud of. Okay. Because it was really hurt. It was, I was a really hurt to your pain. Yeah. Your reaction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're going to tell now, ironically many years later when I went back to a high school reunion, then she was uh -huh. all I felt like Mike Jones back then. They didn't want me. Now, like, now oh, you all so. about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Mike Jones. Anyway, okay. unlike Jesus, we tend to handle our parts by locking them up, even mm -hmm. being busy. If we mm. get over consumed with busy work, always got to be moving, moving, getting involved. It's a way of keeping us distracted. Right, right. Keeping right. us at a point where we've got so much on our plate 
that we really don't have time to slow down. Thank you, Sister Fun. She says she caught the vapors. Yeah, Biz Marquee. Thank you for that. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> we try to deal with our hurt parts by numbing them. Right, right. Through alcohol, mm -hmm. shopping. Mm -hmm. It does, This remark is not about there's something fundamentally wrong with having a glass of what a wine or whatever or by shopping. No, but if you do oh. something to the excess right. because you want to numb, you do not want to feel that hurt and that pain. Right. And some of the things we do are because... We don't want to feel that pain. We, we're numbing ourselves. We lock the pain in the basement mm. of our souls mm. by saying, I need to just get over this. Right. I should just quit whining. Mm. You know, this should be gone by now. Right? What kind of man deals with, you know, such and such and such a thing? In some way, and this is really important for those of us in the church, sometimes we deal with our wounded parts by spiritualizing them. Right. If you just have faith, I just need to have more faith. I just need to read more scriptures. Thank A good Lord, Christian would let go and let God. A good Christian wouldn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, fake it till you make it. Where is your faith? Yeah, we over-spiritualize it. And so we've got to develop, you know, um, to, we have to look at Jesus for our model. And when we look at Jesus for our model, he says, no, man, I don't want you to do that. I want you to bring your burdens, your burden parts to me. Right. I, mm. And so I think the main thing that I really took from this chapter is the typical ways of us handling our pain, the numbing, the shaming, the shunning, the problem with it is that in the end, they really don't work. They actually, as someone said in the chat, they really push it away and make it worse. It actually compounds the issue mm -hmm. and makes it work because now the exiles feel shame for feeling shame. Right, right. They feel shame for feeling shame. Mm. And when that happens, we can't provide ministry for those wounded parts. We can't welcome those wounded parts. The only way we can get to the point of unblending from our woundedness so that our core self can come forth is we're going to have to spend time with our wounded parts. And when they are healed, they transform to bring something wonderful into our internal family system. When these wounded parts unburden, mm -hmm. when they aren't shamed and blamed and guilted and shunned, when, they're, when we're able to bring them to Jesus so that they can find rest, what ends up happening is we find joy and playfulness and tenderness mm -hmm. and spontaneity. Mm -hmm. But as long as they carry burdens, as long as they carry these negative emotions of I'm unworthy, I'm not a good person, I'm uh, as long as they carry those negative emotions of fear and shame and loneliness and anxiety and sadness and all of the negative beliefs like I'm alone, I'm not worthy of love, I'm not worthy of being treated fairly then we'll struggle. We'll constantly struggle throughout our lives and we'll fail to tap into the positive quality mm -hmm. of that personality trait, Ooh. right? It'll remain locked away. It'll remain inaccessible. And I want us to be healed so that we can offer that positive quality to mm -hmm. ourselves, to our loved ones, to our partners, to our children, to our friends, to society and the world. Mm -hmm. The world deserves, the world is just waiting for us to unblend from those wounded parts so it can experience our creativity, mm -hmm. our joy, our peace, our love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes.
Now, I don't want to be not, I don't want to be uh, naive. I know it's not easy. Right, right. Right. But right. those wounded parts, God wants us to unhinder them. Here's what Jesus says. And I think this applies to those childlike parts of us. Let the little children come to me. Yeah. Yes. And don't hinder them. Don't shame them again. Don't burden them again. But bring that childlike part to me. That part. Here's the invitation. Bring it unto me. Mm. Let the little children come to me. That mm. little child in you that felt abandoned and hurt and abused and fearful and isolated mm. and shame. Jesus says, bring it unto me. Let the little children come to me. Right. Don't right. hinder them. Like if you if you read the scripture for their deeper spiritual meaning, mm -hmm. he's talking on a literal level about physical little children, but at a deeper spiritual meaning level, he's talking about those childlike parts of us that have been wounded and hurt. Let those little child parts come to me and suffer them not. Mm. Hinder them not. Mm. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those parts. There's a positive dimension to those uh, hindered parts, right? And so let's not hinder our woundedness. Let's not lock them away. Let's not get in the way of them having access to the power of God, right? Because here's what Jesus wants to do. Jesus wants to embrace that childlike part of us, right? That childlike part of us that 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 that's hurt because someone talked about us. Someone embarrassed us. Mm -hmm. He wants to hold that part of us and comfort that part of us and whisper in the ear of that part. You're OK. Mm -hmm. I love you. And in my kingdom, no one is left out, right? Mm -hmm. See, we want to move towards, but we oftentimes don't know how. Hear what the exiles don't know. I want to move towards, but I have no idea what that looks like. And someone is listening to me right now saying, Pastor, I hear you, but I really don't know what that looks like. How do I respond when I'm so flooded with sadness and shame and doubt and a feeling of rejection? What do I do? Because there are times when we are really over, we are flooded with our exile parts. And last week, I shared with you an experience I had. I mean, last week, I shared with you an experience I had last Tuesday in which I hired someone to perform a service for me. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking forward to it for three months. I had a lot resting on it. I was looking forward to it. And when I showed up, I was so dissatisfied with what they prepared. But mm -hmm. I didn't know how to tell them. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to say this is really not what I paid for. And I paid a lot of money. We're going to have to do something. We're going to have to work something. This is not acceptable. And you know what I did? Because I was so flooded with the feeling of. I felt like if I said something, I, they would see me as a bad person. Mm -hmm. And so I just went along. I just went along to get along. And sometimes we get flooded with feelings of being alone and sad and rejection and fear and shame. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's what I want us to do. When we get flooded with those emotions, I want us to run to God. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus is saying. Come unto me, all you that are weak and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. 
when you're flooded with pain, grief, hurt, I want you to run to God. Someone listening right to me right now, you're in the midst of some conflict, some internal conflict or conflict with someone else. I want you to run to God. Flooding happens when a part of our personality takes over. It gets in the driver's seat. You ever have anger and shame and sadness and grief take over? Right. Get in the driver's seat. Y'all better get that sermon. Who's driving your car? Right. Mm -hmm. Many of us love our children, but we don't want them in the driver's seat. Flooding happens when a part takes over and literally completely prevents us from having access to our core self or the God image. Like, I want you to think about a moment in your life when your entire being gets taken over by a negative emotion, a feeling, a thought, and it can literally have somatic implications. It literally can have a physiological sensation in your body. Mm. It feels as though that part of you has just taken over your entire person. Mm. So a flood is the right metaphor, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we're flooded, the goal and the objective is for us to figure out how to unblend from that part. So that part may not be in the driver's seat. Maybe it's in the passenger seat. And maybe it's even in the back seat. Mm. It's there. It's just not in control. Mm -hmm. And so the opposite of being flooded is when a situation happens, you want to be able to unblend from that part. You want to be able to relax from that part. You want to be able to pause. We we talked some time ago about nervous system regulation. Mm -hmm. We talked about being aware. We talked about pausing. We talked about being curious, asking questions, right? And then being courageous so that we don't let that emotion take over. And we're like out of control. We either shut down or we're fighting, we're, fl we're fleeing, right? The opposite of being flooded is to unblend and to step back, right? Letting our exiles run to God means that we're inviting all of our burdened parts that are afraid of the pain to step back and to give access to our system, to our core self. See, that's the goal. We want to unblink. You want to be able to notice, name. Mm -hmm. You want to be aware that that part is showing up mm -hmm. so that you can begin to step back and to unblend and to let your core image, right, yeah. step up mm -hmm. and be in charge. Running to God doesn't mean allowing that spiritualization to yell at you, to tell you that you're wrong. Run, by running to God doesn't mean going to find a Bible verse to tell you that your part is wrong and should, it, to shame your parts, mm -hmm. your woundedness. That is not what I mean by running to God. What I mean is by noticing, naming, identifying the need of that part and allowing your God image to step forward. It's important to know that exiles get this at just like little children. Y'all remember when you were a kid, <laughs> insisting on having your own way, throwing temper tantrums. When children are in pain, mm and they see someone who can help, they can run to them and try to get all of the tension and they can take over. 
So we tend to get flooded with painful exile emotions as soon as we get triggered. What exiles don't realize is that our God image cannot help them if the heart is taking over. Right. We have to dial that negative emotion back. We have to unblend from that anger. Unblend from that sadness. So we can have access to the God in here. See, the God image is in here and want and is present, wants to shine forth in that moment. But as long as the anger, the fear, the shame is there, that part can't show up. And once they figure this out, once they figure out this is the way to get help, they'll do this just that. You can actually tell your part and get relief from the negative feeling. You can actually speak to that part. Hey, okay. I want to run to God now. I see I'm aware of what's happening. I'm aware of what I'm aware of what's happening. I name that part. Something's coming up. I see you can actually speak to your part. That's why we want you to get to know your parts. Mm -hmm. That's why we want you to get to know your parts, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we know that we're being flooded? It's very simple. We know that we're flooded when our entire system is being taken over by some negative emotion. Mm -hmm. And the goal, according to Dr. Schwartz, is to invite our parts to gently step back and to unblend. To invite those parts to unblend. And after all of our parts, the anger, the sadness, the disappointment, the shame, the fear, step back. Mm -hmm. Then our positive God image and God self, according to the author, can emerge. Those qualities of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, you know, long suffering and self-control can show up, mm -hmm. can step forth. The qualities of this self were consistently what we have been describing as good. Amen. So we're going to stop there. Let me, let me, let me close with this. All of our exiles, all they want is to be seen and heard. That's all they want. They want to be seen and heard. They want to, they want to know that they're okay, that they're not, they, that they're not going to continue to be shamed. And this is what Jesus speaks to us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. The exiles want you to pull up a chair, to give them a hug, and to tell them they're loved. Once again, that is your challenge this week, to take your wounded parts and pull up a chair and tell that part to hug him or to her, hug her, your wounded part, and to let them know that they're loved. They want to know that they matter in this world. And we can show them this by moving toward them and seeing their pain. And here's what I want to say to you. Your exiled parts need the God in you. Mm. That fearful hurting, shameful part in you needs the God image in you, needs the God in you. Amen. I know we're over our time. We'll get to our questions next week. Look, I want you to make sure you get this book. Hey, if you're with us for the first time, I want you to get all together. You, I really believe you're going to be blessed. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, and catch good. up with us. In chapter four, look, we have communion this Sunday for the fifth time this year. We're going to have communion. God has given me a word. I'm in a series that's really built off of this book discussion series. And I'll continue that this week. Look, I want you to get the last two sermons uh, that I preached on this. Get who's driving your car and Jesus take the wheel. Go to YouTube. Go to our YouTube channel and get. Who's driving your car? Mm -hmm. And Jesus take the wheel. 
listen to those messages, get all of these Bible studies as well, which are on our YouTube channel. Whether those sessions are taught by me, Reverend Rice or Kimberly, I believe you will be blessed. Man, look, y'all go in peace mm -hmm. and I'll see you this Sunday and Thank we'll see you, you next Wednesday night. God bless you. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.